Shalom Talmudim. I am uh, going to go over verses 4 and 5 from Jonah 1 today in this screencast. I'm just going to jump right into it because it's two verses, so I don't want it to take too long here. Okay, so we've got Vadonai, simply conjunction and the proper name of the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, Adonai, Vadonai, and the Lord, Hatil. Hatil. Uh, so here we have the reversal of the normal word order, which is usually verb, then the subject. Here we have the subject, Adonai, followed by the verb, telling you what Adonai is doing or has done. Here is... Um, uh, here we have a hyphial form of a hollow verb. So when you have a hollow verb in the perfect form, in the hyphial, you have a he followed by a tsere. Uh, and then the, the hollow verb, whatever the middle root letter is, whether it's a yod or a vav, um, it's always a hyric yod in, in this case, in the perfect uh, the perfect form of the hyphial for a hollow verb. So, hey, teal. Your two options are yod or vav. So, you go to the lexicon, you look them both up, you find out that this is indeed a vav from tool. So, hey, teal is he threw, or perhaps he had thrown. Uh, either one is grammatically fine. Ruach gedola, a great wind. Here we have an attributive adjective. Uh, neither the, the noun nor the adjective are definite, so it's indefinite. A great wind or a mighty wind or whatever. El Hayam into the sea. Vaihi, our verb you've had a number of times, I won't go over it. Sa'ar gadol, here we have a masculine attributive adjective. Here is the feminine, gadola. Here is gadol uh, because sa'ar is masculine, ruach is feminine. A great storm, uh, ba yam. Here we have uh, the noun yam with the preposition bait in front of it, but the bait has a patach and the yod has a dagish forte. And so we know that this is definite. It's not on a sea, but on the sea, and that the indication of the definiteness is the patach and the dagish forte. Great sea, uh, sorry, a great storm on the sea. Veha onia, this uh, comets uh, shva, this composite comets, uh, is uh, the, the o sound. So veha onia. And here we have uh, a wonderful uh, kind of onomatopoetic um, and fascinating uh, uh, two verbs in a row. So, he shiva, he shiva, the hate, he shiva, le he shaver, he shiva, le he shaver. You can feel sort of the 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 rhythm, the swelling. He shiva, le he shaver sort of getting cast back and forth. Heshiva is the verb uh, to consider, uh, to prepare, to calculate, to be about to do something. And you can see very clearly from the hiric under the first root letter and the dagish forte in the middle root letter, this is a PL uh, perfect form. The comments hey is telling you it's feminine, singular. So we've got third feminine singular, P-L, he shiva, she thought, she considered, she prepared, she calculated. Now, again, we have the root uh, uh, or the uh, word order reversed. The subject comes first, ha'onia is the boat. The boat considered or thought about or prepared to, lehi shaver. So here we have the, the Lamed preposition giving us about two or considered two. Um, he shaver, 
E-I-A, where the dog is forte in the first root letter. Uh, the he peculiarly appears in the nifal infinitive construct. I don't quite know why the he appears in the nifal infinitive um, and why it's not a noon. But the noon is rolled up into a ball into the first root letter. You can see it there in the sheen. And the EIA, Hirik Kamitz Tsere, is the classic um, Nifal prefix, vocal pattern, and uh, almost all of the infinitive constructs vocal patterns are dependent on or based on, or basically the exact same as the Nifal pre, uh, the, their, their version of the prefix. So here in the Nifal, EIA is the Nifal prefix, and now he a -A is the nifal infinitive that he is distinguishing it from the prefix as well as the presence of the uh, the, the preposition lamed to be broken to be shattered so the the boat considered or prepared or thought about uh, thought it was about to be broken to pieces uh, so it's fascinating that the, the boat itself is given some agency, some some personhood, uh, which is very typical in the Hebrew worldview. Okay, now going on to verse five, Vayir u, Vayir u, uh, the uh, and they feared, Ha Malachim, the sailors. You can see the He Patach Dagish Forte there of uh, the definite article, Hamalachim, Vayizaku, Vayizaku, and they uh, cried out, the Pa'al or Kal, um, imperfect, Vav consecutive, you can see the, start over here, the, the conjunction followed by a Patach and a Dagish Forte in the Prefix, that's the consistent sign of the Vav consecutive. So you know you have an imperfect form. Whenever you have a Vav consecutive, whenever it starts Vav, Patach, Dagish Forte, you know you have an imperfect and you know you have a Vav consecutive. So then don't be thrown by the Shurik Vav on the end here, which could look like a perfect form, right, as an affix attached to the end. But you know here that it's a prefix complement because you know that there's a prefix because of the Vav consecutive uh, form. So clearly um, demonstrated here. So, and they cried out, plural, they cried out, Ish, singular man. Uh, they cried out, Ish, El Elohav, a man to his God. So this is one of the ways that Hebrew um, uh, 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 communicates uh, universal um, action, you might say. So, um, so there's a group of people, and they they are crying out, and it says, in effect, each man, each one, to his God. So it moves to the singular to describe. Um, how uh, it, it, it could be describing how each one, uh, how they all did something as one, as one person. That's one way it describes universal um, action. And then another way would be saying each one is doing this. Same basic construction, um, a plural form followed by a generic singular representing the group. And then you see the, the third masculine singular suffix here, uh, the vav on the end referring back to ish. Um, okay, and they cried out each one to his god. Vayatilu, vayatilu, this is the same verb as we had earlier, um, vadonai heitil, here's the perfect form you can hear you can hear the relationship, right? Teal, teal, hey teal, and vayatilu, tilu. So 
The teal is the same, but here again, vav, patach, dagesh forte, that's your vav consecutive. The yod is your prefix, and the shurik vav is your prefix complement, telling you it's a plural and not a singular. The yod here is telling you third person masculine, and the vav is telling you here at the end plural. Uh, so the comets under the prefix is always telling you this is a hollow verb. Comets under the prefix equals hollow verb. And so since you only have two root letters appearing here, you know one of them is either, you know that the, the, the letter that's missing is the middle root letter. The comets is telling you that because it's a hollow verb. And uh, then you know from your previous experience that it's a vav instead of a yod, but the hollow verb is just telling you it could be one or the other. The lexicon is where you go to figure out which. Um, so the reason there's no yod here is that the vav consecutive form will often reduce or shrink um, or shorten the verb. Uh, and so you often, if it can be reduced, if it can be shortened, it will be in the vav consecutive. And this is one way that it can be just going from a hirik yod to simply a hirik. But you can hear it, right? It sounds the same. It's just a visual, a visual difference. Vayatilu. You still hear that hirik yod, that e, um, as a part of the hyphial form. Okay, and so they hurled, they threw, they cast et ha kelim. Et here again is telling you that the next word is the definite article. I'm sorry, not the definite article. The next word is the direct object of the verb. So they threw, what did they throw? They threw the kelim, the cargo, the stuffs. Um, asher, uh, relative um, particle, uh, that which. Um, so they threw the cargo which, and then sort of was, is assumed. Ba'onia, in the boat. Again here, how do we know it's the boat? We know it's the boat because the comet's beneath the preposition bait. Now, why is it not a patach with a dagesh forte in the next root letter, uh, or, or in the next letter? That's because aleph is a guttural, and gutturals reject a dagesh forte and don't take a dagesh lene because they're not uh, begad kafad letters. So here we have uh, compensatory lengthening. When the dagesh forte is rejected, it returns to the previous vowel and lengthens it. So here we go from a patach to a comet, baonia, into the boat, um, or that, that was in the boat, uh, el hayam, into the sea. Le hakel, le hakel, this is a tough one for many of you, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a tough one. Um, we have the sign here uh, of the, uh, here's a uh, preposition. So this is uh, an infinitive construct. The he is the sign of the hyphial. And uh, the tsere here is also telling you hyphial. Um, and, uh, but this is, uh, the root here is kof lamed lamed. And I, I won't get into describing all of, of uh, how you know that it has a repeated, the second and third root letter are the same. It doesn't happen all that often, um, but uh, what you want to do is you want to go to the lexicon and just start looking through Kof Lamed. Um, there's no indication that the missing letter is the first letter or the second letter. Um, it's, uh, you know, if this was a prefix and this was a vav and the comets was under the prefix, then it would be telling you this is a, a, a hollow verb. But there's no, there's no uh, uh, comets under the prefix because there's no prefix, so it's not a hollow verb. And 
Uh, there's no doggish forte in the first root letter, so there's not a missing noon, for instance. Um, and so then you want to look either for perhaps you might be thinking maybe there's a missing hey on the end. So you go to lexicon and look that up. That's not there. You just keep scanning and you find the kof lamed lamed. It's not terribly uh, efficient. Um, uh, but uh, an another option would be to use uh, an electronic resource that would uh, give you that information. Okay, so, um, or perhaps in your mind, you are thinking, well, I know that the word kal, which is the name for the Hebrew uh, stem, um, it's the other word for pa'al, kal means light. And so you might um, sort of scan through the lexicon under kof lamed for something that um, means light. Now that, that I wouldn't expect you to, to figure it out that way, but um, that's one way to sort of uh, figure out the meaning in context if you're thinking along those lines. Okay, lehakel to lighten, to lighten. Um, and then the implication is it, referring again to the onia, perhaps, perhaps. Now I'll get into that in a second. Me alehem, me alehem. This is a, a three three different words mashed together. We have the name here followed by the tsere, and uh, meim followed by the tsere is uh, the preposition mean, and you know that it's mean because the following letter is a guttural, which means the noon, which is usually assimilated as a doggish forte in the next letter, is rejected because this is a guttural, lengthening the hiric to a tsere. You might say that the ayin in rejecting the doggish forte tsererizes the hiric. Okay? Mean becomes may. And then we have, uh, so that's from, or out of, away, away from. Al is a uh, preposition upon. And then hem is the third masculine plural suffix, them. And the yod is meaningless. It just is a linking, uh, a linking vowel so that the word is easier to say. So, from, upon, them. So the question here becomes uh, to lighten it from upon them. Why are the sailors casting the kalim into the sea? What is being lightened? Well, you would think that they're trying to lighten the ship, cast the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship, right? I mean, that's logical. The cargo is heavy, throw it into the sea, the ship becomes lighter. Well, the ship is not upon them. The ship is beneath them. So what is upon them? Perhaps this is saying two things at the same time. Perhaps the sailors have both a practical and a theological agenda. They want to lighten the storm from upon them. And one of the ways to do that is to offer sacrifices to the sea god. So perhaps one, one thing that the sailors are doing is not just lightening the load of the ship, but they are uh, casting their cargo into the sea to lighten the wrath of the gods, to lighten the storm, uh, the, the sa'ar gadol from, from upon them. And uh, it's very clear from uh, the entire chapter that the sailors are profoundly religious. They're profoundly religious individuals. And so it's not... Um, 
unheard of. In fact, I would say it's, it's uh, very much within the center of the character. Uh, the, the character is developed around the, the sailors that uh, they would be having a theological agenda for their actions. In addition to uh, the uh, obvious practical agenda. Okay, so they throw the Kalim into the sea to lighten it from upon them. The Yonah and Jonah, Yarad, again, we have this word order reversal. It's trying to draw your attention to something. It's uh, the, the, the word order reversal, starting with the subject, following with the verb, um, particularly in the context of a narrative in which the, the narrative flow is governed by the Vav consecutive, which always begins with the verb. So verb, subject, object, or verb, object, subject, uh, but always the verb, and when that's reversed, it's making, it's the storyteller is emphasizing something or there's a, uh, there's a dramatic or a rhetorical or a theological or perhaps all of those together reason for flipping the word order. Um, the yona yarad, why would the narrator break out of sequence to describe Jonah going down? Well, Jonah's gone down two other times. Jonah went down to Jaffa, and then from the dock, he went down into the boat. And now he go, he's on the boat, and he goes down again. Uh, and so uh, Jonah, uh, Jonah uh, goes down in the midst of the sailors crying out in the midst of the sailors throwing their things. I don't believe that uh, it is accurate in this context to translate this as, but Jonah had gone down. Because that had gone down suggests that he did it previously. He did it before. And I think that the narrator is telling us at this point in the story, that at this point, Jonah goes down in the middle of the chaos. When uh, the sailors are fearing for their lives, he flees again. He flees responsibility. Um, so, and Jonah went down, El Yarkite Hasfina, into uh, the hull, the, the bowels. Uh, uh, the bottom uh, of, of the boat. Uh, this is just an alternative word for boat. They're synonymous here, of course, because they're not on a different boat all of a sudden. Uh, Vayishkav, and he lay down. Vayeradam, and he fell asleep. Here we have very clearly uh, uh, a kal or pa'al, vav consecutive form. The sign of the vav consecutive and the e, in this case a instead of o, um, but uh, hirik under the prefix um, is either pa'al or nifal. The absence of the dagish forte in the first root letter is telling you this is a pa'al, not a pl. I'm sorry, not a nifal. The dagish here is a dagish lene because it's following a closed syllable. Uh, so this is a begad kafat letter, the kaf, of course, vayishkav, and he lay down. And here we have a very clear nifal form. Again, vav consecutive, clearly all three signs present. The tsere under the prefix is there because this hirik has been tserarized. Okay, so in the nifal you would have the the noon of the nifal would roll up as a dagish forte in the first root letter here, but because it's a guttural, resh, it rejects the dagish forte, which lengthens the hirik into a tsere. A, a, a. But this tsere and comets are, are your, your two primary indicators of the nifal, five consecutive, and he 
he went into a dazed sleep or uh, almost like a forced sleep. Um, so that is verses four and five.